Okay. I will. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Maybe, um, who's going to get these lights? Yeah. Oh. These ones in the front. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Okay. Um, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And there's so many people here. This is fantastic. Uh, yes, and, and Mark was very kind to say that uh, this, is, this is sort of impromptu. Um, I'm not an expert on images of the nativity in Armenian art, but I guess I'm close to what that might be. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, we can go to the next slide. I thought I would actually turn this into something of a quiz for you, since you're probably used to you know, listening to the traditional lectures at NASA, which are always very good. But I thought we might sort of turn this around so that you're doing the work, because I've just had a semester of teaching, so I'm going to ask you the questions. And I thought maybe the nativity would be this, the idea of you know, images of the birth of Christ. Might be a good time to explore a couple of interesting questions uh, as they refer to Armenian art and Christian art more generally. So, Let's start with the first question. Now, um, what you're looking at here, uh, in both cases, uh, is these are not examples of Armenian art, as you probably figured out. And Shushan has already just muttered that on the left you have uh, Chartres, the central portal of Chartres, which is, of course, a, a French Gothic, very important early Gothic facade. And then on the lower right is an icon of the Virgin and Child from Byzantium dated to the 6th century. So on the left you have a 12th century Gothic portal, on the right you have a 6th century Byzantine icon. Now, let's forget about all that and just focus on the images, and I will ask you what these two, from a visual standpoint, from a compositional standpoint, that is how the forms are arranged, what they have in common despite the fact that they're from east-west and different subject matter. So what do they have in common from a visual point of view? Don't read anything into them, just visually. Yes, you're making a gesture that looks well, right. On the, the Byzantine, mm -hmm. the, the Virgin is flanked by mm -hmm. two figures. And in the in Chatra, yes. Christ is, is on either side, yes, I mean, those are um, exactly. They call them. They're evangelist yes, images yes, of the images evangelist of the symbols. Mm -hmm. Right, excellent. That's exactly what I wanted. So fantastic. So in both cases, you have a composition that has a center. There's a focus on a center. And in medieval art, whether it's east or west or Armenian or whatever, there is this um, tendency to have a central image, and that central image is usually the most important. So here we have Christ in the center, flanked by symbols of the evangelist, and, um, and topped by these arcades, or archivolts as they're called, and underneath is a lintel. And here you have the Virgin with the Christ child, flanked by um, two saints and angels in back. So in both cases you have centers to the composition. So um, this is just a given, and we teach this to all our students. Uh, but what happens when you have an image, when you inherently you have an image that is a recumbent woman who has given birth to a child. It doesn't naturally lead one to a kind of centralization of an image. It sort of presents, a, in a way, a kind of sort of sloppy composition. There's a woman who's lying down and there's a baby. So how do you turn that into a nice central image? You can't seat her because she just gave birth. That would be strange. So you can't put her on a throne. Um, you can't have her standing. You can't do it in a foreshortened way because in medi medieval art there is no foreshortening. It's too early for that. Dad, you're not allowed to say anything right now. Um, can we have the next um, slide, please? Okay, so here you have, you have um, this is another really interesting example of the, the sort of persistence of centrality in Byzantine art. So here what you're actually looking at is a procession, believe it or not. This is a procession of the Emperor Justinian, and Justinian is standing here with a big gold bowl, and he's actually headed towards the right, and if you could see the whole thing, this is San Vitale, a Byzantine church from Italy. We're going to get to Armenia in a second. But um, a Byzantine church in Italy, there's, a, there's an apse here. So this is actually a procession, but does it look like a procession? No, it looks like Justinian is standing at the center of um, a set of, of men. So again, this idea of centrality is pervasive even in, Im in an image type that should naturally be just, you know, like rows of people. So, um, so what we're going to look at today on the one hand, or tonight on the one hand, is how do you 
create this center? How do you how do you maintain this kind of centralized composition with a, an image or subject matter that is inherently uncentralizable, I think. So that, anyway, that was what I thought about this afternoon when I thought, what can I talk about? Mark, can, can um, we go to the next? So yeah, this is one way of doing it. I'm sorry to dwell on Chartres, for some reason I'm doing that. Um, you have here two examples of early Gothic at Chartres. Stained glass. Here's the Virgin. Okay, so here's the Virgin lying down. Here's the Christ child on this strange table. And um, so you have a kind of centralized position with the Christ child here in the center, the Virgin below, Joseph here, curtain. So there's a kind of, you see that? There's sort of like a center to this composition. And here on uh, another of the early Gothic portals at Chartres, you have the Virgin lying down again, and this is what remains of the Christ child. Unfortunately, he's lost a lot of his body, but he would have been here. And so again, you have this, uh, and, and two figures on either side. So um, this is how, this is an early Gothic solution to this problem. Could we have the next, please? Here is a later, this isn't Armenian for the next slide, I promise. Um, this is a later example of um, a uh, late medieval European uh, treatment of the subject, of the nativity. So here you have um, the, the virgin who is kneeling with this tiny infant here. And then you have, yeah, very small. And then you have uh, probably the midwives here, Joseph here. So this is a case in late medieval art where you're already starting to get the sense of depth. So this is a little bit later, and you have a horizon line going back here. And the centrality is created, although it's, it's not really stressed in this image, is created by this grouping. You can see they sort of circle um, the, the central sort of subject, the, the, little, the little Christ child. But that's not what we're dealing with, with Armenian art. So can we go to the next one, please? Oh, yeah. Um, can we just go to the next one, please? <laughs> well, we could get back. We'll go back to that. Let's go to the next one, Mark, please. Um, <laughs> thank you. OK, so here we have, let's just sort of start with the, some of the Armenian material. Here we have a late medieval um, uh, image um, of the nativity. So a very different kind of scene entirely. Now I'm not saying this is, this is one style that emerged in Armenia, there are others. I'm not trying to set up any kind of essentialist comparison here with Armenia folk, primitive on the left and, and pretty naturalistic on the right. But just to get a sense of different solutions to the problem of the nativity. And what do you do with this woman who's lying down and she just gave birth? And how do you make that into a nice, neat, centralized composition? And um, you can see this sort of is being worked out here on the left. This is we're going to get back to this image later, but this just to give you a sense of, you know, what kinds of stuff we're dealing with. The Virgin is here. Okay, you see her. She's lying down, and she's framed in these brightly colored uh, patterns. And then the Christ Child is right here. So he's still in the center. You see, he's still in the center of the composition. The ox and the ass, who are Worshipping at um, at the crib are here. Uh, we have shepherds from the story that they came to see the Christ Child. Um, angels, some nice sheep up here and here. Uh, the three kings, the midwives who are bathing the Christ Child, and Joseph, of course, looking perplexed in the corner. Um, so it's a very different kind of composition, one that use what, uses what art historians call the vertical perspective, where the images are stacked one on top of each other um, to get a sense of depth. So you have sort of these uh, vertical layers rather than recession into space. So that's how, the, that's how this image is, is formulated. Um, the other thing we want to say about this, and this leads us to the other kind of sort of question I want to deal with, um, is that Christian images are never simply uh, sort of naive um, and perfect reproductions of biblical texts. They're, they're never, it's never as simple as that. They, visual images have their own life and their own tradition and their own conventions that sometimes have to do with biblical texts, but sometimes they don't. Um, and what we're looking at, actually, in this image of the nativity on the left, is evidence for a lot of um, other traditions informing this image. It's not simply from the Bible. In fact, midwives aren't mentioned in the Bible. The ox and the ass aren't mentioned as present at the birth of Christ. Um, and the three ki these three kings that they're kind of made into a formula in the nativity are also not specified at the, um, 
in the birth of Christ as being these, you know, three kings with their, with their fancy garb. So a lot of this um, is the result of other kinds of traditions informing Christian art, among them apocryphal traditions. Um, and that brings us to, well, not we're not going to get there yet, but we're going to have our dramatic reading of an apocryphal text, the Armenian Infancy Gospel, after the lecture. But more on that later, we can go to that. Where is that from? Uh, this is from Sunik. From what? Sunik, in southern Armenia. Oh. Yeah. 15, 14th, 15th centuries. Oh. Could we go to the next one? Okay, just I wanted to show you a detail. Like, for example, notice what she's, she has in her hand. That's very interesting. An apple. Not something you usually see the Virgin carrying. Um, not usually, but why might she be holding an apple? Yes, it could relate to Eve, Dad. Yeah, it could. It could relate to the idea of sort of innocence and salvation and the fact that Eve... Um, in a sense, this is the, 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 it's sort of a reversal of original sin, because now Christ is going to be the Savior, so with the app, you know, the apple shows up again, and it's sort of the, you know what I mean? But is there another reason why the apple could be? And I just read this on the internet today, so I'm, I, what I'm asking about is an Armenian folk tradition that I just read about. <laughs> about, right, yes, you give apples as a gift, now, but I read that you give it also in a specific context of a, of, of a wedding, or you give it, you're nodding your head. Does this yes. sound familiar? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you give it, I mean, I read that it had to do with... It's in Syria and those places. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. It's if the bride is a virgin. Exactly. Uh, and yes. the bride, yeah. the male family the next day brings that red apples to the So, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So, so what was just said is that the apple is a gift given to the, 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 the woman who is to be the wife if she is a virgin, right? No, sort of it's proof. not given. It's not given, it's, what is it? No, the next morning, the, yeah. the male, uh, the mother-in-law okay. takes apples to the I see. To that show that. Was okay. Okay. All right. So it has to do with virginity, and of course, it makes a lot of sense then that, that the virgin is holding this apple because that's the whole point. That she's still a virgin and she has an apple. So it could. There could be layers of meaning here. Well, Mark, don't make a face like that. There could be layers of meaning here. Um, we don't want to necessarily read one thing into it exclusively and not another. Um, Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Oh, and this is just to show you the, the lovely sort of detail of the midwives, and you can see they're here, and they're bathing the Christ child. Unfortunately, this, this page is somewhat, uh, has deteriorated somewhat, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the, the bright pigments um, and the, the use of pattern, which is so crucial and so important to late medieval Armenian painting, sort of uh, zones of different patterns. Okay, can I have some, please? Now we're going to go way back. So we're going to start with what I could really find is the first yeah. images. And when Mark asked me this, I thought, well, of course we're going to find some, some early images of the nativity. And in fact, we do. We find one in the 10th century. So that's interesting. It's, um, it's a gospel, a full-page uh, illumination of the nativity. Um, and it's, uh, we have the virgin... Here, obviously, this isn't a kind of sophisticated or refined representation like we're going to see later. But um, but we see in this, these are these kinds of images are maybe more interesting because they're the first steps and the first steps toward uh, you know the sort of formula formula form you know what I mean like when you sort of con con yeah you make a convention out of something. So these are maybe the first steps toward that, and you can see that idea of centrality sort of here in the. This blob, the red blob of the Virgin, and then the Christ Child here in the uh, in the manger, the ox and the ass, the angels, the star, right, the star that appears in the heavens, and then below already these um, the midwife. I think this is actually an angel. Um, I was trying to figure out who this was. I don't know if you have any ideas. I think it looks to me like an archangel, the way he's holding a staff and what looks like an orb. I don't think that's an apple. And I don't think it's an orange either. I think this is actually meant to be like a golden, a golden orb. Okay. Could we have the next, please? Thank you. And that's just a detail so you can see. What's interesting is, I just want to say one thing. I think one obvious question is that 
you know, what are, what are the earliest images of the, of the Nativity period? And what's interesting is it's not really a part of the of early Christian art. So if you look, you know, if you look at, in Rome at the catacombs, and that's where we always look to see the first examples of Christian art, it's not really a part of the cycle. What's most important in early Christian art is this idea of Christ as Savior, you know, and Christ as um, able to, to heal the sick and, and uh, revive the dead, but not the virgin and child. That's something that seems to emerge as a... Um, and particularly the birth of Christ, that emerges later, it seems to me. And I don't know whether anyone has addressed this subject, but I think it would be interesting to think about. It. You could talk about it in terms of gender or, you know, cults of the Virgin, but that's beyond my uh, specialization. So, the next please. And that's also Armenian? Yes, these are all the ones I'm going to show you now are Armenian unless otherwise indicated. Mm -hmm. So here we have um, another fairly early example of the Nativity in a totally different style. Um, and so we have, again, um, now we have an 11th century image, uh, horizontal now in terms of its format rather than vertical. And you can see how the artist has chosen a different sort of strategy here. So within a, a framed, a simple sort of frame, um, he or she has bisected the, the composition or more, not really bisected, it's like farther over to the left. Um, and uh, the Virgin is here, okay. Um, and the Christ child is here, the ox and the ass, the star, Joseph, the shepherds, the sheep. Do you notice anything strange about this? Yeah, there are four kings. And what's interesting is, again, this is not something that is specified in the Bible that there are three. And um, we tend to, to, it became a tradition because... What's okay? It became a tradition because of um, the mention of frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Is it, is it with gold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the other, right? Mm -hmm. So that there were three things, and so they became associated with three kings. But um, why not have four? So, in, you know, the, obviously this is early enough in terms of the development of this iconography that we don't have it sort of set in stone. Um, so, okay, next please. Yeah, okay, I was going to make a comparison, but I don't know why. Go ahead. <laughs> you can go further. Okay, so now we get into a different style, and this is, again, an 11th century image of, um, uh, of the nativity within what seems to be a sort of Greek-Armenian milieu, uh, probably produced in um, uh, Byzantine, a Byzantine part of Armenia. It's called the Trebizond Gospels. And um, you can see the use of Greek. So we have the Greek inscription, um, I Christu Genesis, I believe. Okay, so the, the birth of Christ. And um, you have here another solution um, to this issue sort of centrality. And here, the virgin within a cave. Now, that's another interesting thing because what you see um, in Western images of the nativity are like stables and things like that and, and wooden framed barns. But in, in Byzantine and in Armenian images, you see sort of caves. And that, again, has, um, is an example of how the visual representations have their own life, and they take their own turns. And um, some people have traced this to uh, like the second century text of Justin Martyr, which, which was, which was um, in Greek, and it, it used the term cave. So there are a lot of interesting sort of twists and turns to sort of discover what the sources are for these developments. But anyway. This is um, very Byzantinizing in terms of the style. It's very much like Byzantine art. So you have the, the angels at the top of this interesting looking cave and the virgin here below um, reclining. In most cases, she's kind of reclining like a classical figure. That is reclining as though on a, you know, like what is it, a triclinium or, or is that, is that the dining, that's the word for dining room? Anyway, it's sort of like that. You know, she's sort of half up and half down. And then the virgin, the, the child is here. Um, Joseph in the corner, and then the, the, the midwife again, um, washing the, the child. So, can we go to the next? Um, so here, I just wanted to do a little comparison because you have, um, this is a Byzantine mosaic um, near Athens, the Monastery of Daphne, um, from the 11th century, and you can see a fairly similar composition, a little bit different. This is a squinch which we know from Armenian architecture, of course, the squinch was very well known. It's the semi, it's the sort of semi-conical um, 
in dev device inserted into the corner of a building to make the transition between the square base and the drum of the dome. And it's typically Armenian. Well, it's, you find it elsewhere, but it's, but it's also a sort of distinctively Armenian building characteristic. It just so happens, this is a bit of an architectural aside because that's what I do. It just so happens that it is in the 10th and 11th centuries that you start seeing squinches in Byzantine architecture. And one thing that really needs to be figured out is why is this, and what is the relationship with the Caucasus, Armenia and Georgia? Is there one, and why do we all of a sudden see this? That has yet to be figured out. But anyway, um, but that could actually, in fact, be related to this, this also, this similarity in terms of the composition, that there's more contact now between Armenians and Byzantines, and you can really see that, I think, pretty clearly, at least I, I think I can, um, in terms of the, the way this is laid out. So, can I have some, please? Okay, that's just a detail. Oh, and the other thing is, I, then I started looking for where else can we find images of the nativities, and just in manuscripts. And um, Achtamar, for example, everyone's favorite church, there is no, uh, there is no image of the nativity. Okay, which is, I don't know, then you, maybe you start thinking, well, maybe it has to do with Gagik, you know, like he's the king, and maybe he just felt like it had to be all about men, maybe there's some kind of gender thing there happening. But in any case, there, there are no Im images of the nativity. There's an image of the virgin and child, but not the nativity. So, But we do find an image of the nativity at, the next place, the church of Tigron Homens in Ani, on the inside. So this is one of the most lavishly painted um, churches, Armenian medieval churches, in which the paint survives. Now that's another thing, of course, we don't have a lot of wall painting uh, in Armenia because the, the surface of the stones couldn't hold... Uh, the, didn't provide a good matrix for the wall painting. And we know that wall painting existed on early medieval churches, we just don't have it. But at Tigran Honens, it actually has survived, and this is later, it's 13th century, but can we go to the next slide? Um, okay, and that's just another detail of this church. And, then, uh, and so we have it, and you, if you look right here, can you see this is the recumbent virgin, and here's the, uh, the manger just above. I think I have a detail. Um, yeah, this is just so you, you, it's sorry, it's not a great slide, but you can see here she is um, reclining, and then you have the midwives below, and there's the basin. So that's the best I could do in terms of architectural context for this. The next is okay, yeah, so there's, here's a map. So we're going to go from Greater Armenia here down to Cilicia, and of course, look at everyone's favorite artist, Taurus Roslin. Okay. So we'll um, start with this one. Here's, and Roslin is so interesting. I mean, again, I'm, there are people who are better equipped to deal with this, Lucy among them, than I am to talk about uh, um, Roslin. But what, again, what I was interested in was this idea of composition. And he's so interesting because of his compositions and the way he sort of frames and, and uh, shapes his composition. So um, here we have uh, another kind of image, again, sort of borrowing from, I think, a Byzantine model. Um, in terms of the use of this, uh, the, the cave or the grotto to kind of frame the, the image of the Virgin. And here she makes this sort of wonderfully, I think, kind of fey gesture with her palm as though she's so exhausted. And then um, you have the, the Christ child here, the ox and the ass, angels figuring largely here as almost an arch. Do you see how they kind of arch above her? We're going to see how that actually becomes an architectural component in another of his manuscripts. They actually turn into an arch. And then you have um, the three kings, uh, the shepherds, and then the midwife below, uh, the Christ child here, and um, Joseph. You know what's interesting? This looks like actually a midwife behind or something, yeah, yeah. which is very unusual. I'm just sort of struck by that now. You know, he's so, Roslin is so surprising in terms of where he places figures, and inside of frames, outside of frames, and here, there's act it's rare that you see a figure almost entirely concealed by another figure, so. But if anyone were to do it, he would. Could I have the next one, please? And here's a detail from a manuscript, another nativity that he did, and you can see, obviously, there's stylistic, Similarity. Um, this is in Baltimore, so you can go see it. You have to ask first, but you can go see it. Um, it's an image of the Nativity, so here's the Virgin again. Similar composition, much more contracted. This is only a half-page miniature. And, um, and you can see how he's sort of playing with the inside and outside with these wonderful like lollipop trees, and then the 
the shepherds just on the outside. I should say one thing that there's a sort of, it's very fuzzy between, you know, what is adoration of the magi, what is the nativity, what is the adoration of the shepherds, and so art historians will kind of use these terms, I think, without a lot of precision. So, um, you know, when you're doing a Google search, it matters. And here's the next slide, please. Okay, and I thought this was fun. I just, uh, again, I just did a Google image search to, to come up with this, but you can really see how he's, he's kind of in touch with Western art. And, you know, I, 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 there's so much that, that needs to be done to really, to know Roslyn, and I know he's very well studied, and, but I think there's always more to do with it, he's, because he's also so prolific. I mean, he painted so many manuscripts. Um, okay, so is there anything else I want to say about this? But I think you can see fairly clearly there's an interesting correspondence. Yes, okay. The next one, please. Okay, yeah. And there, yeah. Okay. Oh, this, I know this is a terrible slide, but this is another of his, and I wanted it to show it to you because here you can see, I think, something else interesting. Now the virgin is, she's actually enthroned now. He's using a slightly different kind of strategy here. So she's enthroned, and then the Christ child is turning this way. He seems to have gotten up out of the crib, but the ox and the ass are still looking in it. Um, and, then, um, and then you have the kings and the shepherds kind of grouped together. Um, what I think is, and then you have like a, almost like a lintel below, and what I'm interested in is how this sort of resembles an architectural portal, um, particularly with like Virgin and child in the center. You see how the angels, these ranks of angels, now form an arch. If you were to extend this, it would be called a pointed arch. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say that. Okay, I'm gonna put that out there. Um, and then you have what almost looks like a lintel below. So I'm reading this in kind of an architectural way because in ar in Gothic architecture, it's very common to have a kind of arch, lintel, archivolt above. Can we go to the next, please, Mark? So like this, right? So you have like the archivolt. This is Amiens. And you have the archivolts, and you have the tympanum, as it's called, and then a lintel. So, oh, and then, Oops. no, that's good. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to point out is, find this. Can you find the star right here? You see this? That doesn't really look like a star, does it? I, mean, I don't know what stars really look like, but this doesn't look like any medieval representation. Oh, there's one there too. But then, what's this? Yeah. That's what I want to know. And what I'm. <laughs> We can't, this isn't a very good slide, we really can't get closer to this. But what I'm, anyway, it doesn't matter. The main thing is, this is a quatrefoil. And this form is very, very common in 13th century France, in Gothic France. I mean, it becomes a kind of part of the visual syntax, if you will. So, um, he, Rosalind is very clearly in touch with, with what's going on in um, Europe. But exactly how that happens, who knows? I don't know. Someone else can figure it out. Okay. What is up with that? That's what is, I don't know what's up with that. Or, I don't know. Yes, exactly. And there's there there's discussion as to whether you know what his identity was, where the name Roslyn comes from, and yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and then just going, I just wanted to go back to uh, Greater Armenia and look a little bit at later medieval um, images. This one from the late 14th century by the famous painter and philosopher uh, Vigor Tatevatsi, and just to show you yet another way of um, sort of uh, formulating the image here with the Virgin, clearly set on the side, the Christ child in the center, the ox and the ass, um, the three kings, uh, and below Joseph, and the shepherds. This may be, I, you know, with all due respect, this isn't my favorite image of the nativity, but um, but it's yet another strategy. And again, you can see that, that um, desire to sort of use patterns and layer patterns, which is so typical of late medieval Armenian art. Can we have the next one, please? And then going back then to the, where we started, I just wanted to show you this. This is that anonymous painter, Sunik, um, from the 14th, 15th centuries. Okay, and that's okay. Okay, and now we get to the fun part. So um, now here's, here's, here's a question for you. Okay, do, you, do any of you know, well, I hope some of you, do you know where this image is from on the left? You know it because you've all seen it. Well, may, you, you may have seen it. Think? It's not far from here. Holy, Holy Trinity. Trinity, yes. This is from Holy Trinity. So my, one of my students took this picture. And it shows, of course, the scene of the Annunciations. This is a segue into the dramatic reading that we're about to undertake. Um, so what I want to ask you, and this is a question I love to ask my students. So I want to ask you, 
do you see when when Gabriel actually comes and tells the Virgin this is what's going to happen do you see that the Virgin in both of these images is responding the same way do you get a sense that she's having second thoughts in either one of these I mean do you it's a fairly big question to ask someone and or statement um, do you see any difference? Remember, this is 1961. This is one of this is the earliest image of the Annunciation that we have visually. So on the on the right, this is the the Etchmiads and Gospels from the seventh century, probably. She's shocked. On the right, yeah. I, she's she looks she looks she looks um she's thinking about it. Let's say that right. She's thinking about it now. Um. Anyway, uh, in a lot of scenes of the Annunciation, she's you know clearly accepting what Christ yeah has to say, submissive exactly as you should. She's you know she's saying fine, great, let's do that. Um, but but the, there's clearly she's having a moment, let's say, in on the right, and she's taking a moment. Um, and this is very interesting. And Tom Matthews, of course, eminent scholar of Armenian art, has talked about this, and he suggested that this sort of hesitation or this moment that she seems to be taking may have to do with the Armenian apocryphal text, the Armenian infancy gospel, because in that text she goes on for pages debating with Gabriel as to whether, as to really what's going to happen here. That is, she. She's a little suspicious, and she wants to know more. And so she keeps, it's very interesting, it's like a debate, and she keeps asking him, you know, can you please explain this to me, how this can possibly happen, and Gabriel, and they're kind of going back and forth, and it goes on for a long time. But in um, the regular, in the standard text, could I have the next, please? In the standard text, and this is just the standard text of Luke from um, King James, she resolves herself pretty quickly. So she says, um, and I'll just read it out. So, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Okay, and then um, Mary says, How shall this be? How shall this be seeing? I not know, man. I don't know, this is anyway. So the angel says, the Holy Ghost shall, you know, do this. And then, very quickly, she says, okay, uh, be it unto me according to thy word. So it's, it's not a, there isn't a long, protracted debate over whether she should do this or not. Right? So that's where Matthew suggests that, can we go back, can we go, no, the next one, the next one. Matthew suggests that this face may have to do with a text that was circulating in Armenia in the form of the infancy gospel that makes a great... <coughs> sort of great subject of this questioning that she has. So, um, what I thought I would do, and this is, this is really, this is not a scholarly thing that I've done, but um, I thought it would be fun, because I was reading the Infancy Gospel in its French translation, I did not have on hand a critical edition of the Armenian, nor would I really be equipped to translate that. But um, I had the French, and so uh, I translated it. It's a few pages long. And um, I translated it into English. And um, when I did that, I realized this is really, this is really a dialogue. It's not, I mean, it's, it's so clearly, Mary said this, and Gabriel said this, and so that was very clear, so I just turned it into a script. And so what we're going to do, right, what we're going to do is we're going to read it as though it was a script, as though it were a script. And um, I think the point is that this is really, I mean, it's, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, it's, it's interesting because this is a, sort of a window into late antiquity. And um, so that will be fun. I think that's, should we should just do up. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do it. All right. All right. So you have a script. And I think another, can I just say, I think another thing to remember is that um, this is, never mind, let's just, let's just present. No, it's okay. I'm not going to say anything about it. We won't, we won't. Yes. Oh, you don't have it? Okay. And um, this is based on. Oh wait, do you have a question? Yes. 
A prize? The red apple? We, we talked about the... the it's probably not an apple. It's probably a pomegranate. You think it's a pomegranate? Of course. I've heard various readings. I mean, we will have to look really closely to see what it is. But are there other images of the Virgin holding a pomegranate? I, I don't know of any. Well, we'll have to do a... I, I think I see some people saying apple, too. I think there's some debate about this. But... We can look further at it at another time. All right. Um, okay. So this is no, no. Okay, I didn't make this up. This script. It's entirely from the French translation. All I did was at times I, I just abridged it a little bit. But this is it. So nothing here is something that I've made up. Okay. This is all from the text. Just so you know that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to add that the, the day after, which was I guess yesterday, or the day before, Christina told me we were going to be doing this, we got in a copy, of, there is a new English translation, there is a new English translation of the infancy gospel, and I, I checked Christina's work against uh, uh, Dr. Abraham Terrian's translation, and it's, it's okay. It's okay. It, it, it checks out. I mean, there, there are no major problems. Okay. okay, the Annunciation. The young Mary goes to the temple. The great priest, Zechariah, asks the virgins to draw lots in order to determine who will weave the veil of the temple and what color thread will be woven. Mary draws the colors scarlet and purple, goes home, and begins to spin the scarlet thread. Then, taking her pitcher, she goes to the fountain to get water. At this moment, someone addresses her. Rejoice, Virgin Mary. Mary is flustered. She is struck with fright. She looks to the right and to the left and sees no one. Whence comes this voice? Whence comes this voice speaking to me? Taking her bottle, she goes quickly to find refuge in her house, closes the door, locks it carefully, and sits down. What what is this greeting? Who is this who knows me? Who have I seen who could speak to me in these terms? She trembles and shudders in her fear and worry. Rising, she goes to pray. God of our fathers, God of Israel, please have mercy on me. Answer my request and the prayer of my heart. Listen to me, your miserable servant, who asks you with hope and trust. Do not lead me to the temptations of the enemy or the tricks of the seducer. Deliver me from the traps of the hunter, because I have hope in you that you will protect my virginity intact, you my Lord and my God. Three hours pass. She again takes up to the scarlet thread to weave. Suddenly, Gabriel penetrates the doors, although they were closed. Rejoice, Virgin Mary, immaculate servant of the Lord. Mary is speechless. Mary is speechless. <laughs> Nancy speechless. Do not be afraid, Mary. You will be blessed among women. I am the angel Gabriel who was sent by God to say to you this. You will become pregnant, and you will give birth to the Son of the Father on high. You will be a great king who will reign over the entire earth. Of what are you speaking? What are you saying? Explain. Just what I told you. You heard it from my mouth. Receive the invitation that I give to you and rejoice. What you tell me is disconcerting news, which has thrown me into confusion and surprise. I will conceive and give birth like all women. How can this happen when I have not known a man? O oh, Holy Virgin Mary, do not be suspicious and understand the things of which you speak. It is not like that. Because it will not be the product of a human creature, neither of a husband nor of the human will, but from the strength of the Holy Spirit who will inhabit you and employ you as he pleases. That which you have said seems, difficult, seems to me difficult to believe, extraordinary. I cannot agree nor resign myself to that which you have said, because what you have said is in principle shocking and in fact impossible. In hearing you, my spirit trembles. I am confused, and I have no response for you. Why are you so worried, and why do you shudder? How can I believe you? I have never heard anything like it, and I don't even understand what you are saying. I have spoken the exact truth. These are not my own ideas, but I said to you what I have been told by the Lord, and what God has sent me to me to announce to you. And yet you take my language as false. Believe the Lord and listen to me. It is not that I think you are speaking falsehoods, but I'm just surprised. That which the heaven and earth cannot contain, how can I support such infinite love and accommodate it in my flesh? How will I be capable of feeding it with my breast and holding it in my arms? 
Your words are improbable, the idea is un incomprehensible, and the realization of it is disconcerting. I would need to be superhuman in order to understand it. Do you wish to abuse me with tricks? Oh, good, insanely virgin, listen to what I tell you. How did Moses on Mount Sinai see God with his own eyes and the bush that burned but was not consumed? How did he speak to Jacob after having wrestled with him? And even the patriarchs and prophets, how did he manifest himself to them? They saw him. No longer have fear. Only believe and listen to what I tell you now. How will what you say happen? And how can I know on which day and what hour this event will take place? Teach me. Do not speak of what you are ignorant, and do not refuse to believe what you do not understand. Lend me your ear with humility, and believe all that I tell you. I do not speak in defiance, nor with incredulity, but I want to be assured of precisely how this thing will happen, and at what moment, so that I may be ready. His arrival will be soon, and in, and in penetrating and inhabiting your womb, he will purify and sanctify the essence of your flesh, which will become his temple. How will this happen when I haven't known a man? The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the strength of he who is on high will cover you with his shade. And God the Word will make from you a body, and you will give birth to the Son of the God on high, and your virginity will remain intact and inviolate. And how could a woman, in keeping her virginity, have a child without the intervention of a man? It is not as you describe it. Your maternity will not be affected by concupiscence or corporeal passion, and your largeness will not be the product of conjugal relations. Your virginity will be holy and without stain. The entrance of the Logos of God will not violate your womb. I'm afraid of you, because you say to me very nice things, but they are all shocking. You seem to wish to abuse me with tricky words, as if, as if I were Eve, our first mother, who the demon persuaded by other agreeable and sweet words. Ah, Mary, holy virgin, but I say to you the exact truth, and yet you don't believe what is coming from my mouth. I who am in your presence, I address myself to you in the name of God. Do not be afraid of me. Do not have doubt. And do not be diverted in your heart from the words I say to you, and that you have already heard and learned from me. What I say is not artifice or trickery at all, not, nor a ruse, nor deceit, but in order to prepare you as the temple and house of the Logos. Listening to you speak, I am taken aback, and I am preoccupied with what answer I should give you. And if I cannot seem to convince myself, to whom could I possibly explain it? Holy Virgin without stain, do not busy yourself with such vain thoughts. I do not doubt your words, and I do not think you are unbelievable. I am now happy, and rejoice in your words, but I tremble to think of carrying God in my flesh, to give birth as a human, and then at the same time, time be inviolate. What a marvel, and how marvelous is the thing of which you speak. And yet, despite my long discourse, and after providing you with a veridical testimony, you still do not believe me. I beg you, a servant of the very high, do not be unhappy with my insistence at questioning you. You know human nature and its incredulity in all matters. That is why I want to inquire exactly what you mean. So do not be upset with the words I speak. You are right, but have faith in me, who am sent by God, to speak to you and announce to you the good news. Yes, I believe you, and I accept the orders that you have given me. It is thus as you have said it. But listen to what I say. Until this day, I kept myself pure and just before the priests and the people, and have been legitimately promised to Joseph to become his wife. What will happen if he finds me pregnant, and what response should I give him? What do I say? O oh, good and saintly virgin, listen well to these words, and keep in your spirit that which I say. <clears throat> the thing of which I speak is not the work of man. It is the work of the Lord who will be realized in you. He alone has the strength to remove from you all anguish. If it is true, and if the Lord himself would deign to lower himself to his servant and slave, then let it be as you say. Exit Gabriel. At the same moment as the Holy Virgin said these words and humbled herself, the word of God penetrated her ear, and the intimate nature of her living body was sanctified, and she was purified as gold and fire. She became a holy temple, immaculate, and the seat of divinity, and at the same time she began to show her pregnancy. Thank you. People have questions. Yeah, then questions. If people have questions, of course, and, and, and not to critique the acting, yeah. but uh, <laughs> please keep them on a scholarly level. I don't have a question. I have a statement. I think that what you presented is absolutely stunning. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, all the artists. Another first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's a story. Yes, but... Could you tell us more about this gospel of the infancy? Yeah. yeah um, it's an apocryphal text that was circulating in Armenia, and I think, I think there was a Syriac version as well, and I think that, in fact, it might have existed... The, the earliest text exists in Syriac, so it exists in both languages. But um, it presents a kind of, it, it's much longer. What I just gave you is a tiny little bit of it, and it actually covers his, um, you know, his early life, Christ's early life, and, and so on. So it's, this is just a tiny extract from it. We're and considering doing a whole series of performances based on, <laughs> on longer but work. But no, no, I should just say, what I found interesting was that this, is a, this was the dialogue. This area was sort of the most like a dialogue as opposed to narrative. It was, so it, was, it seemed to me sort of, it just asked to be dramatized, so for whatever it's worth. When did it exist? When was it written? I don't really know. Late, it was definitely late antique, but I don't have dates Let me for try it. To find out. But early. It's, probably, it's before the 7th century. It's, oh. So... I mean, it existed at the time when this was illuminated, when the image was illuminated, so pre-7th century. And there's an Armenian text of this yes. written in the 7th century? Either in or before, before the 7th century, and there was an Armenian text, yes. And they have it at the Mata Um, I don't know what the history of the, the, you know, where these texts can be found. I don't, I don't know. I could find out for you. Oh, well, but, no, I'm just yeah. curious. Um, according to the dust jacket of yes, the Armenian you. Gospel of the Infancy, and dust jackets is what, are where I get most of my information from, <laughs> uh, the various versions of the Infancy Gospels illustrate how stories like the, about the Virgin and Child lend themselves to be told and retold, much like the stories in the canonical Gospels. The first translation of the full text of the Armenian Gospel of the Infancy, itself derived from a 6th century Syriac text that no longer exists, provides two variants of the famous narrative and several recensions or ancient editions. Etc. Okay. You know, once runs through my mind. They say the Armenian Bible, the Armenian queen of translations of the Bible. So probably the Syria came from the Greek from the Syria. Could be interesting. Okay. A little bit about the Syria. A little bit, a very little. I'm not thoroughly familiar with it. I just did a very, very brief article on it. But this tradition of dramatic presentation based on biblical stories and some of them apocryphal goes back a long way. Life, to, life. And, yeah. and there's reputedly about 50 of these in the Syriac tradition, but not that many have survived. But these performances were done in churches through the 19th century as part of the service. So, I mean, they were, they were done by the congregation. They're particularly subjects that are no longer, that not, are not in the Bible, shepherd this mm -hmm. and that and so forth. So it's a very long tradition of dramatic performance as part of the church service. Thank you very much. This is not actually a church service, though. I just want to stress. <laughs> We focused on the nativity today, but you yeah. also showed some mother and child pictures. Yeah. I am very curious about the tradition of having a mother and child on most altars of Armenian churches. Yeah. Do you know how far back that tradition goes? That's, yeah, I mean, certainly the modern Armenian churches often feature a kind of Madonna and child, yes. a very Western yes. European yes. Yes. Sorry, kind of not more image. Than 300 years old. Oh. If that was yeah, yeah, and yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can't think of any any medieval examples of this. No, no, no. But it is very common. I don't know if that's true elsewhere in the di diaspora, though. I don't know if you find yeah, it, it. You know, the old churches. I was told it began in the 10th century. That's why I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know where that. Yeah. If it, it, I mean, it's very difficult to know that kind of thing, particularly if we're talking about some kind of a panel installed. Then I mean, it's never going to be in the same place it was in the 10th century. I, and then thinking, well, is there any kind of wall painting where you have a virgin? Usually Christ would be, if we have wall paintings from the Christ, Middle Ages, uh -huh. Christ is in the apse, yeah. not okay. the virgin and child. All right, thank you. Christ's language was Syriac, was it not? I, mean, uh, I, I believe it's Aramaic. Aramaic. Yeah. Yeah. Aramaic. It's a little outside of mine. Yeah. <coughs> yes. What, Mark? One more question, and then we have... Okay. Refreshments, which I've started eating, and we'll, we're open technically until 11, so please feel free to hang around, uh, browse, chat, visit, buy books, 
visit? Yeah. Buy books. Buy books and <laughs> Ruth Tomasian, would you please stand up? <laughs> Ruth is here with her new Project Save calendar, which is available for the first time anywhere. I don't know if that's true, but it's almost for the first time anywhere uh, tonight. And it's on, the theme is on Armenians and building, and it's beautiful. In full color. First time. First time in full, in full color. Yeah. And it's in the bookstore, and it's it's terrific. I looked at our copy yesterday, and uh, as always, it's interesting and, and great. So, one final question. Yes? Uh, in the uh, illustrations that you showed, the three wise men, mm -hmm. where did the tradition come from that Balthasar was a black man? It's not biblical. Um, but you, you see it quite often. Yeah, I mean, it just says in the Bible that they came from the East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it became a sort of, um, you know, it sort of became quickly by the Middle Ages a kind of multicultural thing with, you know, people coming, you know, very exotic looking figures. But even in the Byzantine period, you don't see, you, usually they're all, they all look, you know, they don't, they're, there are no sort of African figures. So, no. um, I, and I imagine, you know, I don't, I don't know whether that's a, maybe a Western, Western medieval tradition. It may be. Does it have anything to do answer. with Ethiopia? It could be. I don't that's know. So I can't answer yeah. that question. Oh. It could. Where did they all come from? Do we know where they came from? Yeah, the well, east. It's, all we know is that they came from the east, I mean, from the Bible, but. They've taken a really roundabout route. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't really know the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you can come on Monday evening over at the Armenian Library and Museum.